Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Art and Artifact. Um, I don't know why I'm talking right now, but it's alphabetical. So this is one of my pairings here. I've got these filters that were supplied um, by Eva, but I'm not mentioning that. And I've got this piece here uh, that uh, relates formally um, with the, the circular um, element in the, in the composition. Um, I kind of, as I was looking through the artwork in the collection, uh, I was trying to just kind of keep an open mind and let the, the work speak to, uh, speak to me, and this one really stood out, and I, I thought about the way that the darker tones within that print would uh, react to the tinting of the, um, of the, lens, the lenses or the filters, and uh, I wanted to create a situation where you could potentially look through the filters at the piece and, and kind of notice that that relationship, whatever it might be. I didn't want to be too heavy handed with it and turn the filters themselves into something that they're not. Um, like we discussed handles and some different apparatuses to like uh, facilitate looking through them, but um, this solution seemed to work well. And uh, this print that's very uh, symmetrical um, might not immediately uh, scream relationship, but um, it was the reflective quality of the print that um, drew me to that, and um, sort of just the symmetry of the object itself, and of course the the surface reflection with that piece. And um, yeah, I think they paired really nicely together, and I I think there's uh, opportunity to even see the reflection of the print in the uh, reflective surface if you can. You know, maneuver in such a way that you're not blocking that, and uh, that's that's what I have to say about that. So while we were striking the show, um, Tim Huntington's object was uh, delivered, and um, I'm, it was in a box, so I'm hoping it hasn't been used to uh, suction fluids of any kind. <laughs> so I assumed it's clean and ready to go. Uh, so this one. Um, there's just something really basic about the form and, uh, and the color, and this piece comes to mind um, kind of as juxtaposition, you know, the square shape and that circular sort of um, suction piece, and then uh, the color relationship between those. So uh, the majority of, of the choices that I made were sort of formal, um, based on like the aesthetic of the object and the, and the prints it was related to. Um, the final piece is a little bit different in that that one, um, the pairing is a little bit more dealing with similarity in, in the language that, the, that each artist is using or each of the individuals is using. And so we've got uh, a piece by Reinhold Markshausen and a, a piece from uh, Ted Kuser's uh, book, and this was provided by uh, Lori Zumhoff, and specifically the um, the vignette that she had selected um, starts out talking, describing the sky as a piece of denim with a hole um, that is the moon, like a hole in the knee or something. And so um, I felt like the work glove and uh, like a, a pair of old jeans, there's a direct kind of relationship between um, objects that we use and uh, and when presenting them in different ways, um, how it can kind of frame out bigger ideas. And so um, this pairing was also um, kind of chosen because of their, uh, uh, the two of them being contemporaries as well. Like I thought that was a nice, a nice way to create a, a really cohesive kind of relationship between the book and the, the assemblage. Is that what you would call that? All right, those are my thoughts on the things that I had chosen. Thank you for your attention, and um, you're free to go if you, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> All right, well, uh, everyone will say the same, but thank you for coming. Um, and for those who will be viewing this later, yeah, thank you for taking your time as well. Um, I guess the first thing I would note is that in the selection of all these sort of objects that I, I chose, uh, I was kind of um, interested in the narratives that might 
be coming along with those objects. So nothing that was sort of too fresh. Now, uh, all objects have a sort of narrative, right? Um, I understand that, but uh, I guess you could say it's kind of loose. Most are pretty personal, but there's one object which I'll get to um, that's maybe a little bit more universal. Um, uh, this one, uh, this pairing with uh, Dr. Haley, uh, Gabe Haley, and uh, he, in, in talking with him, a lot of different things. He had this hat that I thought was particularly awesome, but I was like, I don't know, the hat seems like maybe too much of a, a red herring just because it's really nice. But uh, we got to talking about the, uh, the Dickens, uh, this, the, the Dickens work, and um, he said that these books were in a box in his grade school, I guess, uh, ostensibly to be like donated somewhere, given away. And he was like, hey, what's gonna happen to these books? And someone told him he could just, his principal, someone. <laughs> his best friend just said, hey. <laughs> 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 uh, his principal <laughs> gave him the blessing to just take the books. And, uh, um, and, and uh, Dr. Haley has a deep admiration for Dickens' work, as you know, most people do. Um, and then, so I, I like that, right? And yeah, it makes sense. He, he's a literature professor. He has the, the complete works. And, um, and then in talking with Gabe, and we were kind of like, you know, then I was showing him around and, and kind of like what's going on. And, and uh, you know, one of the things that he kind of brought out and, and kind of like talking with them is that like one of the things that he particularly likes about Dickens is the character sketches. And uh, so like looking at this work just seemed really, you know, the, 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 the close work, the Chuck Close work here, uh, uh, which is m m my ideas were more formal in this sense um, and that you know it's it's gridded the books kind of create their own sort of a uh, grid if you will um, but then also yeah it's, it's sort of like a, a portrait of a person right it's like almost like a, a character sketch so I kind of like that relationship um, and, and gave uh, you know kind of brought that to light as well so I thought you know that just works right it's like yeah you know let's just go with that uh, here we have um, uh, so, so the little bulldog right here is uh, Dr. Coe's, David Coe's, uh, and then yeah, the, the sort of uh, the large um, weaver uh, drawing uh, or print of the uh, um, this you know, train. Um, so one, the, the bulldog, he said, is a, a family heirloom. So yes, of course, naturally, you know, Concordia dogs, but uh, uh, David is a Georgia bulldog, and he is very proud right now. Yeah, um, and I'm sure he would love to relive that memory of the national championship with anyone. So uh, you should do that. That would be a nice gift, I'm sure. But anyway, so yeah, this is a family heirloom because also, you know, is a, a legacy student at, at the University of Georgia. And uh, so I like that. I like that sort of little narrative um, to the object, right? And it exists on his desk. And so part of his everyday life in that sort of regard, and it has that sort of a tie to his history, to his family. Um, and uh, uh, and it's like just like kind of like a nice little physical object. I mean, I, I like just the, the actual physicality of the object. And so that's kind of what drew me to the print here. So one is that uh, so much of like seeing just the frontal, or the, the, the frontal sort of nature of the bulldog and how it's oriented sort of related to like the train face, you know, kind of has a face at the front. But then, you know, there's that physicality to like these old steam engines. And there's also this sort of suggestion. I, I mean, I actually really like that it's flattened here. And then you can sort of uh, imagine how it goes back in space. And I felt that kind of fit pretty nicely with the, the Bulldog. And also, you know, form-wise, uh, this, if it were a real thing, uh, would be made of metal, right? But, you know, there's that sort of collapsing. And this is also metal, so you get that sort of a, uh, that like, you know, gritty, you know, uh, uh, physical physicality. At least I did. That, that's what I was getting from it. Um, and there's, I mean, I, I really wanted to force a metaphor like, oh yeah, the Bulldogs are like the strong train engine with the, you know, football team. But that's not what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Plow through Alabama, finally, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, Dr. Cohn might agree, but you know, <laughs> that's not what I was thinking. So yeah, largely formal, right? Um, I kind of, I don't know, I really liked that. I had them paired at facing each other, but then I thought that got a little too much. I don't know. <laughs> but if you, if you really would think, if you disagree, maybe we'll do that later. Who knows? We can kind of walk between them and see how you feel. So we have the, uh, the Hans Burkhardt, and then I'm working with talk, Dr. Christy Jerkin. Uh, and so this is the one that's maybe not so much the personal narrative. Now, I, I mean, maybe she would disagree with me because chemistry implements are probably deeply personal to her, and I would appreciate that. But it's not something that existed in her, in her um, office. Uh, it's more like the workspace at large. So it's a ceramic funnel. Um, naturally, I was drawn to the ceramic funnel because uh, you know I, I have an interest in that sort of material. 
Um, but I also liked it uh, as like a sort of functional thing. And um, I was made aware of this, I never realized it, but uh, this funnel is made by the Coors uh, company, right? And so she told me that like a lot of their chemistry implements come from uh, uh, um, Coors and uh, the, the one that makes all the measuring cups for people in their household, which the name escapes me. Um, but Coors, you know, being deeply interested in chemistry, just end up making all their stuff. And then, you know, they sell it to other people because it's really good. I was like, oh, that's, that's awesome. That's pretty cool. So the funnel, um, and then pairing with the piece here, uh, again, a formal sort of relationship, but also sort of a somewhat conceptual for me. Uh, in a lot of ways, people look at things or containers as like vessels, right? Um, in the same way that we then look at like body as vessel, right? Uh, so body is container. It actually has, you know, a cavity to it, if you will, that it has filled. Uh, and as I, you know, like I, I like to pull the, uh, draw this sort of metaphor out in different classes, um, it's container for physical things, but also, you know, container for like the spiritual as well. Uh, and the funnel, although it's closed or excuse me, open and things can move through it, it's still container. Um, and so I, I like one, how it related pretty nicely formally to this particular uh, uh, work, but then also sort of like in that sort of conceptually formal way uh, from a, maybe not exactly what this artist was thinking about, but also um, similarly related to the, the figure. Uh, the, the Sam Francis with uh, Dr. Brady's uh, little brain toy, um, which I just kind of was drawn, I mean, so it's funny, right, it's squishy. I, I just like the idea of seeing like a toy, because uh, we don't often think of toys as, um, and a lot of this kind of goes for all, a lot of the objects here, but like toys in particular as being these sort of noteworthy objects because we give them to children. Um, that's not all toys, right? I mean, at a point in my life, I'm like, this is a nice toy, because my children have a lot of those. Uh, and there's a lot of toys, I'm like, I'm glad when they're gonna be over this thing. Mostly that's the ones that make noise, right? <laughs> so pro tip, either if you don't like people who have children, give them you know, toys that make music or whatever. And if you do like them, don't. But that's beside the point. This one doesn't, so that's nice. Uh, she, uh, she, so the, the, it's kind of a short history so far. She said that she got this um, in a Christmas gift exchange in the department, but it actually wasn't hers. She wanted it, but it was a uh, uh, someone. I can I can't remember who else it was. But anyways, that person gave it to her because she liked it so much. So it was sort of like a gift that was then gifted to her, because uh, you know she's interested in the brain. And so then she said she has it in her office and her children play with it and they think it's pretty neat. And she was kind enough to, to lend it for a month so her children can't play with it. I don't know if they do right now, um, but uh, hopefully they, there's something else that they can do. So color arrangement, uh, I want something kind of colorful. I also just like the idea that we have this sort of like heart shape here and uh, it's not like the literal heart, it's just kind of heart shape. And so there's like sort of, I mean, it's kind of like, maybe it's a little gimmicky, but you know, you have like head and heart and uh, a sort of, and also like then by splitting the brain halves, it kind of almost fills that sort of like void and you have those two together and that's like, um, you know, person. And maybe that's more, uh, uh, less Roman style way of thinking of it. Sorry, I'm not always in art history referencing Romans or Greeks. And so the Romans are all about like, you know, head up and the Greeks are like, yeah, it's like the full body. And uh, it's not full body necessarily, but yeah, you, you, you see you have the, the brain and sort of heart and I just thought that was kind of a nice pairing. This is fun. I'm pretty sure I could bring my daughter in here and she would love this artwork and she would probably also love the brain. So um, that's where these two kind of came together. The show was a little bit nerve wracking simply because we were asking, or at least I asked uh, my collaborators to choose an object and I had no idea what they would choose um, or come to me with some options. Uh, but the only parameters I put around the object was that it had to be three dimensional. Uh, it couldn't be a, a work of art itself or considered artwork and uh, it had to be interesting to them in some way, whether it's historical, uh, whether there's a, a story to it, a narrative, or they just simply think it's quirky and funny, right? It could be anything. So uh, I got a lot of objects. Uh, this object uh, provided by uh, Susan Mill in her candy dish with the Hershey Kisses. Um, I received it, and the first thing I thought about was like, this is really 
uh, warm and inviting. And the goal of an object like this is to bring people in, bring people together, to create conversation, uh, to give something a little bit of sweet or treat uh, into their lives. And I thought this is this is good. This is a good challenge. Okay, what am I going to do with this? And I admittedly don't know the permanent collection as well as I. Uh, maybe some of my colleagues uh, who have been here at Concordia much longer than I have, or a little bit longer than I have. Um, so it was really fun to kind of dive into the permanent collection and try to select a piece. And I chose this piece uh, by Grant Wood, titled January. I received the object in January. And I immediately picked this piece because uh, I thought it was kind of funny. I, uh, I, I thought the haystacks reflected the Hershey Kisses quite well. Um, I thought the, the title was applicable. I thought the animal tracks kind of coming in and out of the haystacks uh, also tied in well with this welcome, home, warm environment. Uh, and yeah, and uh, obviously very vibrant, bright colored Hershey Kisses with the duller black and white. Um, I even wanted the, the table uh, to kind of or recreate this idea of somebody behind a desk and this is like on their front counter just off to the side. If you've never been down the archives of Dr. Fabi, take a half hour or a day out of your, um, or a day out of your week and, and spend some time because he will, he has such a wealth of knowledge and I was fascinated to know what object he would choose, whether it be from the archives or something personal. This is a light switch from the, the original light switch from the Weller lobby. And I got this object and I loved everything about it. I love the weight of it, it's quite heavy. I uh, love the gold and the black, and the child inside me just wants to push all of these buttons, right? I just want to push them all. And uh, I, I got it, it was incredibly dusty, and I decided I don't want to take the dust off. I want there to be some age and quality to it, um, and to see fingerprints on it. And I, when I found this piece um, by Lucy Fontana, uh, sorry, Lucy Fontana, uh, I, I thought it just fit wonderfully because it matches it's the inverts of the colors, and uh, still has this grit style. And his work takes his paintings and it's ripping or cutting, making it more three-dimensional, almost more of a, a something that's meant to be touched or want to touch it in the same way that I really want to touch this piece um, or the, the light switch from Weller. And um, it almost looks like it's burned or it's had uh, been torn up in some ways, I always think of like an electrical fire or something that happens. Not that that happened necessarily. Well, I don't know if it did or did not. Um, but that's where my mind goes. It also makes me think of uh, my time when I when I worked over in Weller. Uh, I worked right next to Holly Maskey for several several years as a switchboard operator. She was somebody who had buttons all in front of her, and she was our liaison to the outside world and inside uh, Concordia to transfer phone calls and answer phone calls from. Uh, elsewhere in the world and um, just that connection point and this kind of a, as a connection point in the original Weller lobby as a way to illuminate our lives or uh, connect each other and that building and lobby still functions that way today. Okay so this next uh, object was uh, or artifact was selected by uh, Phil Hendrickson and the artwork I chose was Yankee Doodle by Gene Davis and as a, as a filmmaker, I was naturally drawn to this. I was immediately drawn to this because of so many reasons, uh, not excluding uh, a lot of uh, traumatic memories of me in the woods in Florida in the heat with my hands inside a developing bag that's completely dark that I have to switch out film reels uh, without seeing anything, uh, hoping that and praying to God that I don't expose any of the film that might ruin weeks worth of work uh, because the slightest bit of light of course is going to ruin your film reel. Uh, so I see this and it, albeit it's not motion picture film but a um, for presentations or for for a, um, a lecture or what have you but I'm immediately drawn to this because I'm really interested in format and aspect ratio and most of what we see visually is a horizontal landscape orientation and aspect ratios over time moving from 119 to 133, 137, et cetera, et cetera, to what we see now is really wide, typically, like 239 aspect ratios. But having these, what we see be wide, or the intention, the end result be wide, but 
typically film reel is being shown vertically through light. I think it's just a fascinating concept that it always goes up and down, but what we see is taken apart. And typically what we'd see is something projected through here onto a different surface, but what happens when something's projected onto, this, onto the film itself, and instead of seeing it against the wall, we get to look at the object itself. So I wanted to string up just a little bit of it, not too much because uh, it's pretty fragile, um, but I thought this piece would, uh, behind it would uh, kind of transform. Like it completely transforms both of them. Them alone could stand alone and you could have a conversation about it, but when you combine them, it very much changes. And that goes for every piece in this gallery. It's just the transformation once you pair it with something else is fascinating to me. But the, the size of this compared to this small little object, uh, I thought was fascinating, but also just how it transforms when you're moving around it, um, almost colorizing the black and white film um, and completely changing depending on uh, what you see behind it through the work. I love that it was vertical. I love those thin strips to kind of reflect uh, how sound um, sound strips go on the side of well, motion picture film. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of connections there that I uh, am drawn to. Honestly, this just felt right to me. Um, I didn't pair it to necessarily contra contrast, but I think it ended up being, the more I thought about why this why these two kind of sort of fit together to me. Um, you know, I, I think of this as really small, it's ornate, and it's really intricate, and there's a lot of context with tea and tea culture, and whether it's exclusivity, whether it's class, whether it's, um, uh, you know, depending on where you are in the world, or where specifically English, and uh, Basquiat, as, as an artist who, who unfortunately died very young, um, back in the 80s, and he's working in a very radical, very brash style, um, who can easily be looked at as um, ill-defined or so, sort of uh, there is no order to it. But I kind of challenge that question that's like thinking about his work as having order, as having class, as having a lot of inclusivity to his work. It's very approachable because um, of his techniques and the different uh, objects and use and the use of text throughout his work. And um, yeah, that I, I look at the artwork, and I think about it, it's a very specific moment in time. It's very much a reaction to the urban culture and the, the change in artwork at that time, and I, I think about this as sort of timeless, right? But at what stage does this become timeless as well? I don't know. Um, and honestly, this kind of felt like Dr. Nugent. <laughs> I just, I saw these two pieces, and I think they kind of represented her personality just a little bit. I don't know if she'll be offended that I say that or not. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's all I have to say about that. Uh, this is a fascinating exhibit to work on. It really kind of came together just a couple days before we piece everything together. And um, it's a great experiment in exhibition and context and really transforming individual things that can stand alone and uh, breathe new life into them uh, via relationships. The first piece that our, I want to talk about that actually didn't show up. So um, that's all I have to say about that one. Um, <laughs> So let me move into, I, I really went about this um, in a way that I go about creating my own artwork. And so I too want to say thank you to my friends that, that were willing to uh, collaborate with me on this as well. Um, but I, uh, I uh, got the pieces and before I even got them, I went back into the permanent collection and I just started looking through things. And I try to uh, always work really intuitively, and I don't always know what it means right away, but then through the process, it'll make sense to me somehow. And so I went back and I, uh, we, we all kind of talked about going back and putting tags on works. I, I think I had like 25 works with a tag, and I said, I, I'm sorry, um, you know, I'm not gonna use all of those, but I, I, there was just something about them, not knowing what the object was gonna be yet. And then when I got the objects, it was very quick for me to go back and select because somehow there was a connection um, intuitively, there was a contemplation about it. And then it's, but before I got too far with that, it switched more to a formal thing. And so um, I, I'll kind of just talk about how that works with both. And I, and I also did a little research on these objects. It probably isn't very good research, but I do that as well as it allows me to understand the um, original definition of something and then I like to work with metaphors or symbols and so then I kind of try to create my own visual language in a way that may certainly not make sense to anybody else but me. Um, 
Another thing that's really important here, and I've been really harping on this with my students this year, is the importance of presentation. I think we get into uh, the rhythm or the kind of generic approach of saying, well, 56 in the middle and you know, divide your piece in half above that and half below. But presentation can make a huge difference in how we look at art. And so if I start with this piece, Kathleen Wheeler gave me this piece, and um, I, I looked up, I researched that book, Where the Wild Things Are. And what I really came down to that seemed most important to me as I started thinking about Kathleen and Vicki and John was my relationship with them and then what I think about them as people. And so when I was looking into Where the Wild Things Are, it talked a lot about you know, the, the imagination of a child, but also uh, survival and growth and then overcoming challenges. And uh, I find that in my own life, uh, I, I'm always looking for moments of peace, which are hard to come by. And it's not just me. I think we all maybe grapple with that a bit. And so um, those of you who know Kathleen, not unlike a lot of us, but she had a re really challenging year this year. And I got to thinking about the idea of overcoming that challenge for her. And then, you know, the relationship within that situation and then this idea of a children's book and how the author tied that into his own childhood. I thought, well, I want to set this up in a way that you could actually sit there almost in adults or children could come and sit and read that. But also uh, a contemplative thing about looking at this piece. And I do want to switch a little bit and give uh, uh, my friend Russ Sommerfeld some credit here. Where are you? There he is. Uh, as we were looking at that, he said, that seems like North Dakota at night. And I thought, well, that's where the wild things are. So it all worked out, Russ, thank you so much. Um, but I just thought about the idea of if the lights are kind of calm and, and I was actually maybe wanting it a little bit darker, but sitting there and then you see yourself in that. And so the contemplation of what am I going through? What am I trying to overcome? What am I surviving? That sort of thing that it can become very childlike in a way but also some of the things we deal with as children continue on through our lives. And there's a simplicity about it, but I think as we get older, we maybe make things a little more difficult sometimes. So that's part of that uh, positioning there. And I just find a lot of mystery about uh, Richard Serra's work. It seems very simple. A lot of people would probably just go, yeah. But that kind of work makes me think deeper. So that's the reason why. And I love that we had these little chairs. That was wonderful. In this Motherwell piece, I looked at it, and there was something interesting about it to me. And then when I saw this piece, I thought about um, the gesture and the movement of a marionette. And then also, there's something kind of cultural about it to me that seems reflective. And then also, uh, you know, and we all did this, but looking at the, the lighting, we spent time in reflection of, you know, seeing these linear things come off on the wall that relate here, and then all this linear in the string. And so when I start looking at things like this, I don't even think about that as a string, but as a line, okay? And so breaking, breaking it down to a formal uh, sort of situation, and uh, I just thought, well, and I did work with this marionette, well, well, quite a bit, actually, and just trying to get it into a pose of contemplation. And I, I always thought Vicky is someone who is contemplative and really thinks about things. And I, I've been trying to find this uh, actual marionette or the, something like it. I, I can't find it, but uh, the, the purpose behind marionettes is to, in dealing with the strings, is to uh, create a character about it and a purpose. And I certainly know Vicki is someone of character with great purpose. And I hear that from a lot of your students, too, by the way. You know, I looked at military pins, and of course, John is a historian. So to me, the obvious connection there, and like Aaron, I asked my folks not to tell me anything about them as well. Um, and so I, I, you know, I was thinking, well, naturally, there's a connection with history. But I thought, you know, things about military pins is to honor and patriotism and serving and connecting. And and I, when I think about John, my friend John, I think is somebody who is so committed to service and. I, I thought about this idea, this Martin uh, Purrier piece. I think there's something peaceful about it, but within it, there's all of this line stuff going on. 
and I, and I'm only um, applying this to John, not that he feels this way, but I just know John, Dr. Heem, to be a very busy person. He's in high demand because what he has to offer. And so with him, along with my other colleagues, not just the three that worked with me, but in my students too, I, I often pray for peace. Um, and to find those mom moments to ponder, which seem to be not very important to us in our culture because we have to be doing, doing, doing all the time. But I think there's great importance in taking time to ponder and peace. And so I was looking at these and I lined them up and I thought, nah, I don't really like that too much. So I kept texting John, do you mind if I take him out of the case? I said, I might put him in a cube and then you laughed at that for some reason. Um, <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then I said, can I pile them up? And when I first read it, I thought you said no, but you said something else, I don't know what it was. Um, and so to pile those up, and I, and I actually found the underneath of them to be uh, more mysterious and kind of interesting to me in the relationship here. And then I think it was three, maybe four of them had a tag. And I, I purposely brought the uh, uh, string, whatever, out to kind of mimic the circles. And to me, that was extracting out of a lot of stuff in finding peaceful moments. So um, that's what that was about for me. I don't know if I have anything else. I take notes, but I don't like to read from them because uh, I get stuck. Um, one thing about Kathleen's too, she just shared with me when I went to get the piece from her, um, and this fit with the book really nicely, that she takes trips to Alaska and works with indigenous kids there and there's one little kid she told me that no one ever wanted to work with because he was really problematic and uh, she showed me pictures and you could see just through the images that this little boy really loved her and she spent time with him and, and they said oh you know I can't remember his name and I probably wouldn't or shouldn't say it anyway but uh, she asked if he was going to be there and they said do you really want him there and she said I absolutely want him there and she made a difference for that little kid so um, I think those things tie together so I, I think I'm done.